Welcome to part two of the studio series. So far, we've built the structure, a small wing attached to the main house, and we hung two layers of 5 8 inch drywall on all the interior walls. Here's the small gear closet entry in the control room. You can see some of the angles in the ceiling and walls. I used a double paned insulated fixed glass for the two windows then placed another laminated safety glass pane inside, creating a 7-inch dead air space. This made them fairly soundproof, and they're a great light source. There are other techniques and products available for soundproofing. For example, you can use resilient channel strips to isolate the drywall from the framing. I considered this option, but decided against it because I'm in a quiet area and my house is a very quiet environment as well. So I didn't think I would need to be extreme in my isolation building requirements. Another optional method of soundproofing that is very effective is using a vinyl barrier. If you want to really create a barrier, these solid sheets beneath or between layers of drywall are the best way in my experience. There are new products available that incorporate a barrier into the drywall. Quiet Rock is a good choice if you're going to go that route. It's available at Lowe's and it's not too expensive. One of the most important considerations when designing your home studio is the properties of the acoustic spaces you will be creating. If you're lucky enough to be building the room from scratch, you can begin to address this from the outset with the basic shapes of the spaces. The live room and the control room, if you are separating the two as I did, will have different acoustic requirements. The way I see it, the control room needs to be accurate at reproducing sound, and the live room needs to be uh, musical and great at capturing sound. The shapes of the room, to whatever extent you can control them, have a great impact on these qualities. Let's briefly examine the basic properties of sound in a room. Bear in mind, I'm no acoustician or a physics guru. This is just stuff I've picked up along the way. There are three primary interactions with the walls and ceiling and floor in a space called axial modes. These are the parallel surfaces in the room and the sound bouncing back and forth between them creates what are known as standing waves when the wavelengths of the sound are equal to or are multiples of the parallel distances. There's quite a bit of math involved, but standing waves are sounds that reinforce one another, building up areas of high and low pressure at the same location in a room. There are also three primary tangential modes and sound waves travel along these reflected paths as well, with the same resulting standing waves created at certain distances and frequencies. Add to this still another set of modes called oblique, where the sound waves reflect in several different locations on a path through the space, and you begin to see how complicated the sound wave structure in a room actually is. The sound you hear in a room is the combination of the direct sound pressure waves from the source combined with these reflected sound waves. The reflected sound waves are good and bad, adding spaciousness and volume, but at the same time creating nulls and voids, canceling out certain frequencies, as well as amplifying other frequencies. Taming the acoustics of the space is an intense process. There is sophisticated software and measuring hardware for calculating the responses in a room. There are also post-processing devices that will measure your room as sound is played and shape the acoustic output to optimize how good your playback sounds in a space. One method of taming the reflective modes in a room is to eliminate the parallel surfaces. Here's a floor plan of a studio I worked in. Notice the lack of parallel surfaces in the wall plan. This idea is continued into the ceiling planes as well. Having seen this studio, I was inspired to use the concept in my home studio. In my original plan, I had the wall dividing the control room and the live room, 
angled. I had to revise this plan to get more space in the live room, but I did manage to break up the parallel walls by adding angled panels along the two long walls. I kept the ceiling asymmetrical and treated the parallel glass end walls with different materials to further tame the reflections. In the control room, I was able to modify the shape of the ceiling to break up reflections substantially, and the parallel walls I again dealt with by applied treatments. I've mentioned treatments a couple of times now, so let's look at what that means. There are two basic types of acoustic treatment, absorbent and diffusing. The absorbing type can be dedicated to the mid and high frequencies or to low end bass trapping. Diffusers scatter the sound reflections into many fragmented directions and help to eliminate flutter echo, while mid and high range absorbers soak up the echoes and ringing in a room, as well as controlling the reverb time. Bass traps minimize the room's low end standing wave issues. Every room is different and every room where your recorded music will be played is going to sound different. If you have a booming bass standing wave in your control room at, say, 100 hertz, then you'll probably mix with 100 hertz cut well down in the mix, and then your recording, when played back somewhere else, will be missing that 100 hertz information and will sound thin. The best you can do as a studio designer is attempt to be as accurate as you can. I built my main wall absorbers using Owings Corning number 703 acoustic rigid insulation. I started with a top and bottom angled plate, framed the sides with one by pine, then friction fit the insulation into the frame. The varying depth creates what I hope is a variable frequency trap. I didn't want the live room to be dead, it needed to sound lively, so I covered the panels with some burlap fabric then put varying size strips of walnut plank on top. The slots between the planks allow for absorption of the sound and the planking itself reflects different slices of the frequencies and the angle of the panels diffuses the reflections into many different directions. The room still sounded too live for my taste so I added RLX panels in strips between each of the absorber panels. The short walls remained parallel so I used different materials to absorb and diffuse them. I used a stone veneer on the bottom of the glass wall. The rough surface made for a natural grate diffuser and looks good too. At the other short wall, I used RLX diffusers up high and dampened the rest of the wall with homemade panels. These were extra speaker grill covers that I had and I lined them with rubber carpet padding inside. The flanks of each wall were covered with RLX absorbers, and the corners have RLX base traps. I put some diffusers on the ceiling and built a hanging absorber cloud that I made from some slat wall I'd found thrown away outside a bookstore. I joined the two angled panels at the end, built a little three and a half inch tall frame above and laid insulation inside. I drilled some holes in the panels as well, I'm not sure if that had any effect. The slat wall surface on the bottom face is a diffuser in itself. The live room sounds great. I never measured it with any equipment. I just love the way it sounds with the piano in there. Drums also sound great. They are a bit loud when played with an ensemble in the room. I've hung thick quilts around the drums to help with volume when this is happening. In the control room, the head end needed to be dampened to eliminate as many rear reflections from the monitors as possible. Because the space is not really deep enough to have the monitors off the walls, this became a problem area. I wanted to put the console along the short wall at the gear room end, but it was too long, so it had to go in front of the glass. It looked good on paper. I dampened the entire wall behind the main monitors, but that's where the glass is, so I had to really work hard to solve this problem. The answer eventually was buying new monitors, made by Don Audio and designed to sit on a console bridge. There will be a separate review on these when we get to the gear. The side walls needed some spots of absorbent material, and the rear wall I used a combination of diffuser and absorbent panels on. 
I saw some great diffusers at Paul Smith's Dragon Crossing Studio and decided to build a couple for myself to fly above the sweet spot at the console. These look very nice too. I think how the room looks is very important. You absolutely need to create a mood in your working environment. Crafty Hands has a wonderful vibe and is a real pleasure to work in. I did measure the control room. I installed a graphic EQ to help tune the sound to be as accurate as possible. But over time, I discovered that I like the natural sound of the space better. I've only done one real mix here with the band all working on it together, so I don't know if it's translating perfectly well yet or not. However, when I compare the mix with source material I really trust, it seems to be sounding pretty good. So that's it from my acoustics tour. Thanks for watching and be sure to come back for more of the Crafty Hand Studio documentation. Also, please sign up for the backstage membership at craftyhands.net to have access to the ongoing music projects, videos, and archived concert downloads. Listen to music. It will make you better.